Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, a lot of people you may or may not have heard of me, and you may or may not have heard of Half the Sky before today. And part of the reason for that is is that we have uh, been a little bit of a stealth organization for the past 16 years, working very quietly in China uh, in order to celebrate the, the, the cooperation of the Chinese government and to, to give them ownership of, of the great work that, that's happened. And so I'm gonna take, a, I'm gonna take about half of my, my allotted time here to show you in brief, in a little eight minute film, what it is that Half the Sky does. And then uh, I will very quickly sort of take you through the history and answer your questions. Okay, thank you. So can we play the video? Oh, sorry. We come in what appears to be an infinite variety oh, of shapes and sizes. We live our days pursuing a limitless assortment of activities desires and dreams some of us it seems have absolutely nothing in common except what we need to survive but there's one thing that all of us share something so fundamental to all humans so essential that it separates us from other creatures the need to love and be loved so what happens when an infant a still developing child is deprived of that most basic human need Babies who live without knowing a loving human touch simply fail to thrive. Without hugs and caresses, essential growth hormones are not stimulated. Children deprived of love have smaller brains, weaker bodies, are prone to illness. If such a child survives, and so basic is the need for love that many do not, if such a child survives, she will struggle to learn, struggle to make friends, she may never fall in love, trust another human being, hold a job, strive for a goal. She may never know happiness. Is there any hope for such children, the ones who spend their most critical early months and years languishing alone and forgotten? Can anything be done for children like these? Yes, most definitely yes, something can be done. We learned that in 1997, almost by accident, when my husband Richard and I brought our little daughter Maya home from an orphanage in China. Maya had never known love or what it felt like to matter to another human being. You could see it in her face. There was an emptiness about her, and then buried deep down an aching hurt. But when she felt the love of family and began to trust that it was hers forever, our little girl blossomed. And when I saw the joy and love of life shining in our Maya's face, I just knew that if loving family-like care could be given to children living in Chinese government welfare institutions, those children would also thrive. And so, along with other adoptive families and new friends I found in China, I created Half the Sky. The journey has certainly not been easy. But we persisted. Today, over 100,000 once forgotten children have been given a second chance at childhood. Half the sky is everyday proof that nannies don't need to be biologically related to the children in their care to create the nurturing environment that allows infants and toddlers to develop trust and self-confidence. Proof that carefully trained teachers, mentors, and foster parents can do the same for growing children as their interests, abilities, and social awareness broaden. By any measure, whether quantitative or qualitative, Half the Sky programs offer plenty of evidence that providing orphan children with a warm, stimulating, loving, family-like atmosphere is the next best thing to growing up in one's own family. And you can see it in their faces. Forming an attachment with a child who's never had one is never easy, but is essential for healthy development. It's nature's way of enabling her to go on through life, forging friendships, family bonds, loving adult relationships. When Ai Jing came to us, it was clear that she'd never formed a trusting bond, that magical connection between parent and child we call attachment. She couldn't make eye contact, didn't want to be held. She responded to no one. In the days before Half the Sky's Infant Nurture Program, this might have been the end of Ai Jing's story. 
Instead, she was assigned her own trained and experienced half the sky nanny. Very young children are especially resilient. Within just days, Ai Jing began to emerge from her shell. We can never know what life was like for children before they are brought to us. All too frequently, when they enter the orphanage, they come bearing the scars of trauma. In Xingyi's case, whatever happened left her speechless. Despite normal intelligence, she had only the language abilities of a six-month-old infant. It impacted every aspect of her development. But in the warmth of a half-the-sky preschool, where highly skilled teachers use an innovative curriculum that combines aspects of the Reggio Emilia approach with the best of Chinese methodology, Xingyi is learning to speak. And she's now happily flourishing in every other way. Most important, she's already learned that she is loved, that her life matters. Is it ever too late to learn that lesson? Older children like Lolan often have lived all their years deprived of love. They struggle to figure out who they are, how to live a life. How can such a child find enough confidence to begin to dream of a future? Half the Sky's youth mentors help older children like Lolan with their studies, help them to explore special interests, learn new skills. Best of all, Lolan's mentor has become her close, trusted friend, someone who helps her to discover her talents, encourages her to work for what she wants. And so in time, even with older children, the answer becomes clear. It's never too late to learn you are worth loving. No child should ever have to face a life or death situation alone. Little Soufe, abandoned because she had a hole in her heart, will find more than life-saving surgery at half the sky. The odds that she'll survive increase dramatically when surrounded by the healing powers of love. Before half the sky, orphan children with developmental or physical challenges were destined to spend their childhoods languishing inside institutional walls. Now children like these in a half-the-sky family village, little brother who couldn't walk, big brother who couldn't feed himself, little sister who was too shy to speak in front of others, and big sister who it seemed might never read, each of them now lives in the embrace of what every child needs in order to thrive, the love and support of consistent, caring adults. Today, based on this single, simple principle, Half the Sky partners with the Chinese government, an enlightened foundation and corporate supporters to help China reimagine its entire child welfare system. Through a landmark initiative, one like no country has ever seen before, we're working together to train every single child welfare worker in China. And today, Half the Sky's new Chinese sister organization, Chunhui Children's Foundation, is beginning to spread its wings enabling Chinese citizens for the first time to contribute to the welfare of the country's most vulnerable children. We still have a long way to go, but there will come a time, maybe not too many years from now, when half the sky's ultimate goal will be reached. We will see a loving adult in the life of every child. That day will come. We always knew it would. But what does it matter? A Chinese philosopher once said, all the children who are held and loved will know how to love others. Spread these virtues through the world. Nothing more need be done. the Sky now operates programs across China for children from birth to adulthood. All, all of the programs, the focus of all of the programs is to provide the love of family for children who've lost their families. Um, I came to China, I, first, I finally got, I, I got the idea for Half the Sky in 1998, a year after we, we adopted Maya and we saw how she was transformed by a family's love. I, I, I saw through my kitchen window this child who, who had completely, uh, was like a butterfly, had just opened up. And I thought, oh, so it's so really so simple to do this. We can certainly do this for all the children we can't bring home. 
that took me about a year to get my first government meeting. I knew I had to come to China. I had no qualifications. I was a screenwriter. Uh, I, I uh, didn't speak Chinese. I'd only been to China once before, and that was to adopt. But, but I saw what had to be done, and nobody was doing it. By the time I finally talked my way into a government meeting, um, both the Human Rights Watch report uh, and the film, The Dying Rooms, had caused such an international uproar that China did what happens in Asian countries when face is lost. They said, thank you very much for your comments, and they closed the doors. So when I got there, no foreign visitors were allowed in, in welfare institutions at all. I talked, uh, you know, I was a filmmaker. I, 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 I sort of moved that first mountain by saying, you know, by, by offering to partner. I, I, I was not afraid of um, to sort of getting out there. I really didn't know what I was doing anyway. I just knew I had to do it. And so I, I said that I would, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the mother of a child, a beautiful Chinese daughter who came home with all sorts of problems because she was institutionalized. And I saw what happened to her. I saw what a family's love could mean. I know, I think I know, by then I was armed with a lot of scientific evidence, but, but I think I know how we can do this for all the kids. Will you partner with me to see if we can make change? And, and I think despite the fact that, that the doors had been closed, um, the, the documentary and, and the Human Rights Watch report did sort of alert the government that something had to be done. It was not a high priority in China at the time. This was 1999, and, and China was very much a developing country. And, you know, from the government's point of view, these children who had a roof over their head, and, you know, some of whom actually survived, were some of the lucky ones, because at least, at least they, you know, they had some kind of care. Um, but all that, all that uproar did alert the government that there had, there had to be change and maybe, you know, no, no one was really offering solutions. So maybe I was the least threatening option available. They decided after another year of talking to give me a chance to set up a pilot program in two welfare institutions in two provinces. I had one year and if it didn't work, I was out. Well, of course, I knew it would work. I knew it would work. And six months into the program, the children were acting like children. No more banging their heads on the walls and rocking and picking at themselves and, and you know, running up to strangers looking for, looking for love. Um, the government quietly started sending delegations from Beijing to observe what was going on. But they didn't do anything. They didn't, they didn't offer to support us or say, okay, let's go, let's go across China. No, nothing like that happened. For the next five years, we rolled out our programs very slowly, city by city, by province by province. I'm sorry, could I have some water? Thank you. And, and um, each time we'd go to a new city, we had to explain all over again what it was we were doing and, and how important the programs were and how successful they were. And they were really starting to work. Finally, in 2005, I got my first evidence that the government at the highest levels, at the Ministry of Civil Affairs, which had responsibility for, for child welfare, uh, children, institutionalized children in particular, I got the first evidence that they had been paying attention. And they invited me as a foreign expert, which of course I wasn't, but took it, <laughs> to come to China's first national conference on, on the welfare of children living in, in state institutions. By then, that was five years in, into our work, there were a number of charities, traditional charities working in China, foreign charities and, 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 and a few domestic charities working in China uh, to help orphans. But there was no NGO that was focused on systemic change. There was no one there who was trying to disrupt a broken system. But we were the only organization invited. And that really, that told me something. Um, 
I spoke at that event, and afterwards, I heard government officials sort of speaking my words. They started using the word nurture. They said something to the effect of what I had been saying for the last five years, and that's that, that's that uh, nurture, loving care, bonding with a consistent caregiver, those things are as important to a child's development as food and shelter. They're just as basic. They're just a, as fundamental a human need. They said things like that. It was like, as a screenwriter, was, I was hearing my script. It was great. And from that point on, they started inviting us to become involved, not in policy setting, but in setting guidelines for care of orphans. The very next year, Children's Day, June 1st, 2006, Hu Jintao gave a speech at the Beijing Children's Welfare Institution, and he said, orphans and disabled children are our most vulnerable citizens. We must all rise up to give them, to allow them to live under the same blue sky of the motherland as us all. And out of that speech, by the end of, by the end of 2006, the government announced the Blue Sky Program. That program uh, was a typical government program in a lot of ways because it was really about building new buildings, uh, nice new children's welfare institutions. And as someone who doesn't really think an orphanage is a good place to raise children. That, that was, that was kind of not what we were going for. But in January of, two, of 2007, the government came to us and invited us to provide the software in these beautiful new buildings. And so that was our first national partnership with the Ministry of Civil Affairs. It was their first uh, national partnership with an international NGO. And through the Blue Sky program, we began creating model children's centers in every province in the country, most of them in provincial capitals. Um, in 2008, the, the next year, um, there were a couple, couple of things happened that, that uh, affected our relationship with government in a, in a positive way. I mean, there were two, two horrible things that happened, but you know, for our work, it ended up being positive. One was uh, during the, the Chinese New Year Spring Festival, there were these horrible storms across all of southern China, and people could not get home to their families. You know, the, the time when all of China travels, being shut down. But, but for children in welfare institutions across southern China, there, it, was, it was a really desperate situation. Not, not because there was no home to go home to, so that was home. They had no power, they had no coal, they had no food, they were running out of water. And it was becoming a dire situation. The stores were all closing, there was nothing in the stores. And Half the Sky became suddenly a relief organization. And were able to get supplies, money, the banks were closed, uh, money, food, uh, uh, the things, the diapers, uh, to children in institutions, in 98 welfare institutions across southern China. So after that, our, our government partnership grew stronger. And then just a few months later, when the Wenchuan earthquake happened, we were the first they called. They called us and said, can you help the children, orphan children in the institutions in Sichuan? We ended up spending three years there helping not only orphan children, but children, traumatized children. We brought in counseling services. Uh, um, we created big tops in, in uh, the communities that they'd built for displaced families, uh, sort of refugee camps, but really nice ones in China. Um, and uh, we, wor we worked very closely with the government to help children deal with, with the trauma of, and the loss. Later that year, Half the Sky became the one, one of the five registered international NGOs in China. The first two were Gates and Clinton. The third was Li Kaxing. And uh, we were among the other two that became legally registered. Before that, all international NGOs worked in a gray area, ourselves included. So our partnership with the government was really strong. And then just a year later, 
uh, a really wonderful thing happened. So I, I'm saying this all to say, it's not like I did this. It was like it was meant to happen. A year later, um, a really visionary leader in the Chinese government came to work as Director General of the Welfare Department of the Ministry of Civil Affairs. His name is Wang Jinyao. And Wang Jinyao was one of the uh, uh, creators of the Village Voting Initiative. He spent many years going village to village and, and working with, with local people. He is from, he's from a very poor village himself, working with local people to you know, elect their, their local officials. When the earthquake happened, he, was, he became dir director of uh, disaster relief, and so he oversaw relief in the Wenchuan earthquake. And after that, they sent him to us. So he became responsible for all, all welfare in China. And because of him, half the sky was able to quietly influence government policy. The things we talked about with him, he was a, he's a real dreamer. And, and he, he is he's a very outspoken man. Some of you may have interviewed him and, and, and know about him, but he, he's, he's very outspoken, but he's very positive about China's future. And many of the things we talked about ended up in the 12 five-year plan. And, and I know they're working on the 13th now. So we've had a, a Thanks to him, and then thanks to the openness of the government, we've had uh, influence way beyond what any of us would have ever imagined. In 2010, the ministry came to us and said, we don't want to wait any longer for Half the Sky to, to uh, open its programs, to, to, to make its way across China. So um, won't you please partner with us? And so now, we're training, co-training with government, every child welfare worker across the country. We had a big celebration in 2011 at the Great Hall of the People, and we have a, a full partnership with the Chinese government, helping them reimagine their entire child welfare system. So it's my pleasure to tell you a really good news China story, because we, we certainly hear a lot of bad news ones, but none of this would be happening if it weren't for the Chinese government not only allowing it, but wanting it to happen. So thank you very much. I'm going to sit down if you have any questions. Uh, thank you very much. While you think of your questions, why don't I start off with one. Have you seen any change in the past year and a half since the uh, Xi Jinping administration came in? Uh, and uh, particularly, I guess there had been uh, speculation that prior to the party congress that you might see, for example, Liu Yandong become a woman member of the standing committee and somebody who had a lot of background in welfare policy. Uh, she didn't. Uh, uh, so how how do you how how have it all have there been any big big changes in the, in the past year and a half, or are they still focused on I guess other issues? So there's it's still going forward with the same uh, policies. Thank you. Whenever you talk. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Um, I've seen changes, but I don't know what they mean yet. So I, I've seen there. There's been some reorganization with the, the government agencies that, that we partner with, and so far I don't I don't see anything happen that's going to actually affect our work or what we're doing. I mean, we 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 live in a very small, thin world in in that very big world. Definitely, uh, people are moving around, and that's all I can really say at this point. Okay. With that, why don't I uh, throw open the floor? Who would like to ask the second question? It's always up here, please. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in having... And please introduce yourselves. Oh, sorry. There's a microphone behind you. Um, my name's Sarah Lazarus. Um, I wanted to ask about the staff that work at your orphanages. How do you um, source them, and who pays them, and how do you train them? So they're not our orphanages. We work in state-run welfare institutions. So we operate programs inside the welfare institutions. In, in the places, Half the Sky now is, is really focused on training and mentoring because we're trying to 
spread a methodology throughout the country. But in order to get to that place, we started programs. We started programs in multiple orphanages. In those places, all of the employees are locals that we have hired and trained with, with the institution. We uh, have, from the beginning, paid their salaries because there weren't enough of them and there was not enough money allotted to hire additional caregivers. The uh, institutions now pay all of their benefits and in some cases the institutions pay their salaries. So we have about, I think, 1,300 uh, caregivers direct that are, that are giving child the children direct care. Um, nannies, uh, uh, teachers, preschool teachers, foster parents, and uh, youth mentors. Those are, uh, those are employees, they, they, their uh, work contract is with the welfare institutions. And gradually, the institutions are starting to take that, that over. What I should say is that our intention from the beginning has been to turn everything that we've built over to the Chinese. So we have been trying to put ourselves out of business since day one. And we actually are getting there. And, and it, we're actually seeing them create their own programs and cover all of the costs themselves. Richard? Hi, Jenny. Um, Hi. Uh, Richard Harris. So I work with an organization called International China Concern. I think we've had some, some links. I'd like to say thank you very much. And, uh, it's been a fantastic achievement, and I, I know from what I've seen from ICC. Um, I'm also writing a book from ICC, and mm. I definitely want to follow your publicity uh, <laughs> team because they've done a fantastic job, and, and so they should. Um, my question is, one of the things we struggle with is of handing over, because we found that um, we can really nurture children by having quite a high carer-to-child ratio, let's say 8 to 1 or something like that. Um, and we know that if we handed all the children back tomorrow, that would slip from 15 to 1 to 30 to 1, maybe not go back to the 100 to 1, which was what happened in the dying rooms. Um, is that something you struggle with as well, is that attitudes haven't quite changed and may still take another generation to do so? Um, in some places, yes. Uh, our, our, our approach is a little bit different because we, what, we, what we're doing now um, in, in partnership with the government is a after a series of trainings, we are basing in, you know, we have a model children's center. We're trying, we're almost, we're almost in every province. Uh, and in, in, in each of those model centers, we are basing a child development expert who uh, travels throughout the province, offers tra ongoing trainings, ongoing workshops. We have about uh, 40, a team of about 40 field supervisors who are scattered throughout China who are always on the road. So even, it doesn't really matter who's paying the bills. Those people work for us, and they are constantly not just upgrading the quality of our programs and not just maintaining the quality of our programs, but, but our goal is, is to keep them striving you know, to get better and better. So we invent things like competitions. We have uh, uh, workshops for orphanage directors, two, two workshops a year where they all come and they learn and they, they share, uh, they brainstorm. So we get everybody involved. We're, we're working with the government, government to make it more competitive, to give star ratings like hotels to welfare institutions. You know, whatever we can do to make it fun and exciting and, and, and uh, to help professionalize something that's been sort of menial. We're also, uh, we've built an online community for welfare workers so they can all log on, they can talk to each other about their problems. We have a downloadable video resource library that shows them best practices in child and caregiver interactions. And we're developing an e-learning course for certification through the government that will allow, uh, you know, a lowly child care worker to elevate, to become a social worker. We're also talking with uh, Beijing Normal University about creating a, a, a course for, for welfare administrators and for caregivers who want to elevate. So, you know, we just keep, we just keep saying, you know, this is really important work you're doing and we need, you know, we need to get out there and make it as important as it is and to, make, to, to professionalize something that's of tremendous value, not to each individual child, not only that, but to China. 
I mean, it's investing in children who would otherwise be burdens to their society. Over in the corner, please. Is that Jim? Hi, uh, Jim Seymour, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, sort of a two-part question. Uh, you ended your talk saying that none of these improvements would have happened if it hadn't been for the Chinese government. But couldn't we also say that these improvements wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the uh, Human Rights Watch report, which everybody should know it's a 400-page report with a lot of detail. And the bottom line is they blame the Chinese government for the high death rate in the orphanages. And, and after that report came out, even though the government issued just denial after denial and the whole book was a pack of lies, but things did start to get a little better. And now I'm wondering if you can help us get a general view. I mean, there's sort of a good cop, bad cop mm -hmm. uh, game going on here. And they've, a, a de Chinese government, of all the huge tens of thousands of NGOs out there, the government only recognizes a tiny handful of them. And they look for non-threatening folks. And apparently they find you in that category. And so they're willing to cooperate with you knowing that if they don't cooperate with somebody like you, they're going to hear from the bad guys mm -hmm. in New York. So can you give us uh, a picture of uh, the total situation? Because obviously the orphanages that you uh, work in are, well, maybe it's not obvious, but to me it seems they're probably not typical. They probably let you have access to the ones that they want you to have access to. And if a reporter shows up, a South China Morning Post reporter showed up at one of the other orphanages uh, some quite a while ago, asked for access, and the answer at the door was, you cannot come in. No foreigner has ever been allowed to enter this orphanage. So uh, that leaves us wondering what the, the general overall picture is. Uh, it's wonderful that these improvements are taking place. How representative of the total situation is that? So the first, you know, the first thing you said was, is it, tr is, isn't it true that this, none of this would have happened without the Human Rights Watch report? And I think I said that, absolutely. Without, without that report and without the dying rooms video, I don't think this would be happening today. You know, that was the beginning of my talk, and the end of my talk was that the Chinese government has made possible what we're doing. There is not a welfare institution in China that we cannot get access to. I say that unqualified. I understand that a reporter from the South China Morning Post cannot get access to an orphanage and that you might be told something that's not, you know, that one might be told that it's never happened before. Um, I totally understand that. And, and I'm not saying that, that, that the institutions are like open to the public and, and, and there's no, there's no sensitivity. I mean, they certainly, they still today feel stung by the, the dying rooms, the undercover video. I st I've talked to people, you know, that were, were there then. You know, so, so um, I don't know what to tell you. We, ha the, the places we work are all, all across the spectrum. In the capital cities, in the big cities, the places where we build model centers, where we want to control the quality, we want, we want a, something for people to strive toward, those are pretty nice places. They don't feel like orphanages. But there are many, many county level institutions that we are training and we are working with very, very carefully and we are elevating them together with government. It's, it's just true. It is what it is. There's a place, um, if you read the book, uh, one of the things that happened in 2002 was we got shot, shut out of Guangdong province at the last minute. And there were two small county level institutions that we were trying to help. And it, I had volunteers coming and, and plane tickets bought. And at the last minute, uh, there was a scandal. It had to do with trafficking, I believe, and and uh, we couldn't come. So, so we ended up going to another place in Hunan Province, taking the volunteers there. When the book was ready to come out, it, it came out in March in the U.S. 
I got a, a communication from someone who had been to one of those orphanages recently, and it was even worse than what I, that what, what I hadn't been able to help back in 2002. And we went there without any problem. It was very easy for us to get access. It was a terrible place. This is uh, in, in uh, southern Guangdong province near Zhenjiang. And uh, it was a terrible place. We came in in January this year, and we have been transforming that place with the complete cooperation of government and you know, local officials. Uh, in six months, I was just there last week. Miracles, absolute miracles. Everybody wants it. This director told me, we don't, we don't want your money. We want the training. We don't know how to do it. Everybody wants it. They want to make it better. It's, it's, it, the, peop the, the government workers who run these places are not bad people, and they're not people who don't love children. They just don't know what to do or, or how to use the resources. So that's what we've taught them. Yes. Okay, one last question here, please. Hi, uh, my name is Lee Hawley. I work with uh, HRT Edge, a boutique human resources firm. Thank you very much, Jenny. Sure. It's very, very impressive what you've done. Uh, my question is along the lines of a sort of a management perspective, thinking about the sustainability of your programs uh, will need to be carried forward by the leadership of these orphanages. And they really need to internalize, uh, you know, the whole belief system about how to care for the caregivers and nurture them and develop mm -hmm. them so mm -hmm. they can nurture and develop the children. Uh, have you faced any challenges in that regard in terms of more traditional you know, leadership approaches, top down? You know? Oh, definitely, definitely. And, and how have you addressed but that? We, we just work with them constantly. And, and you know, some are better than others. And they're, in, in the beginning, I was very careful to only select uh, directors where I, I could you know, I used to be a filmmaker, I was good at casting, where I could see in their faces, I could see that they, they were going to go for this and, and that they understood what I was talking about and they would take pride in their work. Uh, but of course, over the years, we've dealt with all kinds and you just get better at it, you know. And, and, and what's really, what's been important to me all along is, is finding Chinese leadership, not just in the individual institutions, but for the organization. So, um, the, the, the great news was that at the end of 2012, we finally got permission to set up a Chinese sister organization, Chun Hui Boai, which is 100% Chinese own run, uh, but it's, it's, base, it's, it's uh, built on an international model. So it's like an international NGO, but it, it is a registered Chinese organization. And we've just hired a wonderful CEO for that organization who's, who's moved over from PepsiCo from a very high level position and is going to dedicate her life into continuing the transformation of China's welfare system. So it's, it's going to be completely out of foreign hands in a few years. And half the sky is working toward it, and we're almost there, to just being a training organization, training and mentoring others to, to uh, implement these values throughout the child welfare system. And we will go, we will, we will go away the moment we are no longer needed. Our, uh, my mentor, Wang Zhenyao, has said that will be 25 years. I don't know, I don't know, but we'll be there as long as we're needed, and, and we, but we, we will not be operating the programs or running things. Thank you all very much. I think uh, Jenny will be staying here after the lunch. If anybody would like to come up, I see a couple more questions. We always do try to, to wrap these up at 2 o'clock sharp, just uh, so that people can count on being able to get back to their, uh, to their desks. Before we do so, I'd like to give our guests something to remember the club by. Whoops. Let me put it here. It's an empty bag. very small. <laughs> Well, usually, we know, okay, I know what this is. Okay. Uh, usually, I guess we've had, actually, we've had a, a run of male guests, and they're always getting the tie, and so it's easy, and I think we have two, we need a smaller bag, so we need more women guests. It's we're a lovely bag, more women speakers. We love, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you all for coming. Also, if, if any of you would like to purchase books, I'd be happy to sign them, so I'll just stay here as, as long as you would like. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.